My office is on the fifth floor of that library tower. And there is a fantastic little study nook on the fifth floor that has a rickety old chalkboard. So as I come and go, I get a glimpse of the sorts of ideas students are wrestling with and even an eye into the life of the library late at night. And the other morning, I came into the office and this message stopped me dead in my tracks. I don't know who wrote it, but I hear in it a bold proclamation. And I share it with you because I think it challenges us, professors and students, to think together about how grades fail us. How, that is, they get in the way of the work we are here to do. So imagine with me who the student is who wrote this. What comes to my mind most immediately is a struggling student. She's in a really challenging course. It doesn't play to her strengths, and she is just barely hanging on to that 3.0 she needs to keep her scholarship. So late at night, she's here at the study table with her physics textbook, her problem sets, and her lecture notes, and she writes this on the chalkboard with what I hear is a tremor in her voice and maybe a tear in her eye. She says, my GPA does not define me. She's gathering up all of her internal reserves to hold on to her intrinsic desire to learn because that external grade is just about to exhaust it. She's resolving herself to say, I'm going to go take that 8 a.m. physics exam and I'm going to do my very best. And when I get the grade back, it's just feedback. I'm not going to misunderstand it as some final verdict about my capabilities and my talents. I admire her inner resolve. But as I walked past this message, it stayed on the chalkboard for a good two weeks, I began to hear yearning in the bold proclamation. And I started to wonder if maybe this wasn't the 4.0 student, the student who was so wildly successful in all of her pursuits that she's never experienced what it means to risk, what it means to be so so far onto uncertain ground that you feel you're in deep, deep water and you're not sure if you're going to learn how to swim before all your energy is exhausted. So I picture this student doing her thing in the library and her eyes fall on the course schedule for next semester. And she says to herself, next semester I'm taking that really difficult philosophy course on mortality and meaning. I know it's not going to help me do better on the MCAT, and I recognize that it may very well make it harder for me to get into med school. It is unlikely I will get an A in that course. But my GPA doesn't define me. I'm taking that course because I know it's going to make me a better doctor. It will help me get my mind around big questions about the end of life that I can't even begin to articulate yet. However, I tell this story whoever the student is, the theme that em emerges in my mind is this idea that grades are amplifying attention between two important purposes college serves. On the one hand, college is often thought of as a passport to our future. And when this is its purpose, we think about what courses do I need to be taking? Am I getting the right grade in those courses? Am I taking advantage of the right opportunities so that when I graduate, the job of my dreams stands before me? But there's also this really powerful myth of an idea that says college is a time for self-discovery, for the cultivation of our talent. And that project emphasizes the question of who am I? And who do I want to become? And to think about that question, we have to hold off, at least for a minute, the question of what do I need to be doing next in order to get ahead? And grades are always in the back of our minds, right? Tempting us to play it safe. Hide yourself. Leave that weakness untested. Leave that area of ignorance unexposed, even though that means we can't explore it. As if somehow when we graduate and we get that diploma, it's a magic piece of paper that it's going to compensate for all of the weaknesses we haven't tended to. The fear of failure 
the pressure to perform. The well-meaning advice of parents and teachers and advisors about what we need to be doing next in order to get ahead, all of that makes it really hard to carve out space to just wonder, to get lost in our thoughts, to try our hand at something new, to feel comfortable, authorized even, to be clumsy in our first, second, and third attempt at something. So I admire the students who are pushing back against those forces to say, I want space to try my hand at new ways of investigating the world and new ways of thinking about the human condition. And I admire their courage for being willing to step on, out onto that uncertain ground where deep learning and discovery can happen. So I want to help them out. And I think it might be easier to resist the way grades press upon us if we simply recognize how they get in the way of our work. So I want to turn to think now from a professor's perspective how I see, three ways I see, grades getting in the way of our work. And the first is they simply put us in wrong relationship to the coursework as well as to one another. So, what do I need to do to get an A in your course? It's a reasonable question. Responsible students can ask it, but note how that turns our attention to the particular coursework, those discrete tasks, and makes them ends in and of themselves, where we professors have designed them to be means, invitations, ways into this body of knowledge that fascinates us, and we want it to fascinate you too. What do I need to do to get an A focuses me on the hoops I need to jump through to get the letter grade rather than the project that the professor wants, which is to master this body of knowledge and make it your own. There's a physicist at Harvard whose name is Eric Mazur, and he tells a story that makes this distinction between performance and mastery really clear. The physicists have gotten together and said, look, Anybody who's gotten through physics one should have mastered these fundamental physics concepts. So let's put a survey together and see how well we're doing. Professor Mazur almost doesn't give it to his Harvard students because he thinks it's too easy and they're going to be offended by it. So he's a little puzzled when he passes it out and they take longer working their way through it than he planned. And finally, a student on the front row raises her hand and says, Professor Mazur, how do you want us to answer these questions? Like you taught us for the exam or how we usually think about it. There's not supposed to be a difference, right? And focusing on the coursework can mislead us to invest all our energy in becoming a really good test taker or a really good paper writer at the expense of investing our energy into puzzling through the mysteries of this way of seeing the world. This dynamic works the same way in relationship of student to professor. When a student says to me, Professor Dutton, what do I need to do to get an A in your course? She's engaging me as an authority figure. And I'm just a professor. I have an expertise in this small subject matter. And that expertise equips me to teach, guide, and mentor students in this way of seeing the world. But it doesn't make me any sort of gatekeeper or guardian. And I'm definitely not here to rank, order, and certify students. So thinking about that role of the professor brings me to the second way grades get in the way of that deep sort of learning. And it's this. They end the conversation just as it's getting going. Think about what we all do when we get that paper or exam back. None of us, myself included, can resist the urge to flip to the back of the page and see what grade is stamped there. And if it's an A, we celebrate. Maybe we throw the paper up in the air. If it's a C, we're dejected. We toss it in frustration onto the table. Either way, we're not motivated to go back and see in those comments that the professors made in the margins where she's calling attention to our strengths. This is a brilliant idea. Do you see it could lead you in this, that, or the other direction? Or where she's pointing out a weakness, saying this is a tantalizing, unclear claim. What do you mean? 
or where she sees we're reaching for something and is offering three or four ways we might more fully develop it. That's where the educational uh, exchange is happening, right? In those moments where the professor designs an opportunity to practice something, the student does her best, gets feedback, and goes back and practice again with greater attention and greater confidence. And the grade simply interrupts and ends that feedback loop. And this brings me to the third and most dangerous way grades get in the way of our work to do that deep learning. Because not only do they end that important conversation, but they reaffirm the wrong lesson. They teach us to look into an external authority figure to tell us what work we should do, to tell us what we've done well, to tell us the value of our work, to tell us if we are an A or a B or a C student. And do you see how that is such a small step away from looking to an authority figure to tell us our worth? You are not defined by your GPA. And the most important lesson my colleagues and I can offer is learning how to cultivate that capacity to judge our own work for ourselves well. Here's what I have in mind. Learning to know when we know something and learning to know when we don't know something. Cultivating that sense to say, I am certain I am applying the right formula, the right process, the right argument to this particular problem at hand and paying attention to that inner voice that says, hmm, something's not right here. Let me rethink this using a different formula, process, or argument I can draw on. It means cultivating the confidence to say, this is my very best work, and I know it measures up and meets the challenge. And also cultivating that sense of humility that says, this is my very best work, and it doesn't yet measure up. And then hopefully having imagination and a whole broad perspective to draw on to say, what expertise or new perspective do I need to bring in so that my best work can rise to meet the occasion? I think this art of judging our own work well is so difficult to master. I struggle with it, and I don't know anybody who is certain they've gotten it right. Emerson tells us that people wish to be settled, and only insofar as we are unsettled is there any hope for us. And I think it is exactly this art of judging our own work well that he has in mind. Acknowledging that we have a natural instinct to seek external affirmation, to want the security of the title, the credential, the honorific, the award, the esteem of our peers. But recognizing, too, that our hope lies in our ability to affirm for ourselves, this is the work I see that needs to be done. These are my talents that can do it, and I will be responsible so that I can take credit for what it accomplishes and attend to the risks and the ways it falls short. Do you see the beauty of making this lesson at the heart of all our work? It brings together those two purposes college serve. For what can it mean to become a professional, to lay the foundation for a successful career, if not to move from being an apprentice to a master who can say, this is the right practice to apply in this situation? And a master who can say, I need to do a consult with a colleague because I don't know this situation well enough. And what else could be at the heart of a liberal arts education but this art of living freely, this art of authorizing ourselves to recognize what work we can do and when we've done it well. Because the art of judging our work for ourselves is so difficult, and because I see it at the heart of so much of what we do, I think we should be practicing it at every turn. So that means I want students coming into my course not focused on how do I get a grade, but how do I rest the ideas that we're studying in class? Integrate them into my thinking so that I can take them with me far after the course is done. 
And how can I master this body of knowledge so that I can draw on it in anticipated situations and the unexpected situation to which it might speak? How can I, across all of my courses, be inculcating habits and storing up stories so I have this deep reservoir to draw on so I can fortify my independence of mind and sharpen my powers of perception? To the extent grades not only distract us, but at times purposefully interrupt that work, I resent them. And if you feel that way too, I invite you to please take my title as your mantra and say F grades to tame that fear of failure, to tame the ambition for success. Say F grades, right? To keep yourself from following that chasing after credentials so you can invest in cultivating your talents. Focus on the feedback, not the grade, so you keep that transcript and resume in their proper place, and you don't let them flatten out your inner depths or eclipse your spontaneous creative powers. You are not defined by your GPA or your test scores, or your job title, or your salary, or your community standing. Say F grades to resist all those forces that would press upon us, urging us to bend and break ourselves, to jump through hoops of an anonymous market forces or social conventions, all at the expense of gliding ghost-like through our very own existence. Have courage to venture onto that uncertain ground where you might say for yourself, this is my work, and it gives my life meaning and purpose. Thank you.